Well, if you're glad to be in church, say amen this morning. Man, boy, that didn't sound very exciting. If you're glad to be in church, say amen this morning. Man, I tell you, that the, the, the 9 o'clock service is out amen in the 11 o'clock service, and y'all got plenty of sleep. What in the world's going on? But it's good to see you. I'm glad you're in God's house. We're glad you've come to worship with us this morning. If this is your very first time at Liberty, thank you so much for coming and worshiping with us today. You have honored us by being here, and we appreciate it so much. You can do us a favor, though. You can take that connection card that's in the chair in front of you. I promise you, I'm not going to show up at your house tomorrow. We're not going to spam you. It's just a way to help us get to know you better, put a name with a face and a face with a name. So fill that out for us. It makes it so much easier for us to know you guys, and it helps us to communicate with you guys. So fill that out for me if you get a chance. We'd like to also welcome all those who are watching online. If you're on Facebook watching us this morning, you can amen in the comments because sometimes it gets quiet in here. So you can just comment amen or give us a thumbs up. That makes me feel like you like the preaching too. I'm glad to see you today. Glad you're here. Whether you know it or not, this week is special. Coming this Friday, we'll have the Compassion Experience. We'll be here on Liberty's campus. It'll be here Friday. It'll be here Saturday. It'll be here Sunday. And it'll be here Monday. And so Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday, if you've not went and made a reservation, you need to do that. Now, you can show up anytime, and they'll let you walk through. You'll just have to wait a little bit. But if you make a reservation, you can show up and just walk through. It won't cost you anything. It's free. I promise you the registration, they're not going to spam you. They're just going to register you as a time for you to be here. And so make sure you do that. It's an exciting moment for our church. Now, I want to say this to you. We're going to show you a video of what the Compassion Experience looks like so you know. But I want to say this to you, that if you're going to miss a Sunday... Miss any Sunday this year you want to, but don't miss next Sunday because God's going to do some great things, some awesome things, and you're going to miss it if you're not here. So make sure, I don't care if you miss any other Sunday all year long, you need to be here this Sunday. We're looking forward to what God's going to do. I believe God's going to move in a powerful way, and this time we're going to show you that video. I was released from poverty in Jesus' name, and this is my story. First, the moment I stepped inside, I was amazed. It's basically this progression through this child's life. It takes you there. You get transported to another country, and you get to live that child's story. Mama has always worked whatever job she can find but there is never enough money. I think hearing the sound of her voice, hearing her talk about her story. When I went through my own story, I was literally crying. My pictures, my photos, and it was very realistic. Jesus changed my life through the work of compassion. The stories and the way that they're told and weaved in and out of these rooms is pretty powerful. You have to do something that just calls you to act. Yeah, I just think it's going to take the breath away. It's an unbelievable story of faith. Seeing it really changes things. It was moving. There's way more hope in this building than there is poverty. This is my story. If they're to be supernatural. Now, when I say supernatural, I'm not talking about walking on water. I'm not talking about healing people. What I'm talking about is a church where God is moving and God is doing things and God is saving people and lives are being changed. And if we're going to be a supernatural church, there's some things that we must be if we're to be a supernatural church. And this morning I want to preach about being a mission-minded church. Mission-minded. One person's with me. Praise the Lord. There's a problem with missions, though. I, I'm going to tell you a story, and then you can relate it to missions. How many people have been to Myrtle Beach? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. You've been to Myrtle Beach. You know, when I first moved to South Carolina, I had never been to Myrtle Beach. I had never heard of Myrtle Beach. I grew up in Florida, and, and we've always, and even now, when I go on vacation, I go to Florida because, you know, I'm just that's what I do. And I remember my wife's grandparents went to the Myrtle Beach every uh, year. They would go in the, in the, some of you here are those crazy people that go like the 4th of July week, right? Well, they would go, the, they were going to the beach, and, and I was a poor guy, so I had to work, and my wife and kids went down with them, and I was going to join them later on, and I was working construction at the time, and I got off about five, and you know, back in the day, you couldn't Google it, right? And you couldn't get like a, a GPS instructions, so I had to write out a, a way to get there. Lynn's granddaddy probably helped me write it out because he was a walking direction machine. And he gives me this, and I'm looking at it, and I'm like, there's not an interstate on this way. 
How many people realize there's not an interstate to get to Myrtle Beach? Y'all realize that? Not one. And you go through all these little towns. You know what I'm talking about? You go these little towns, little towns. And so I, I end up working late that day, getting done construction. I'm tired. Go home, take a shower, pack my stuff in the truck, and I'm headed to Myrtle Beach. And I get to this little town called Mac B. Is that right? Am I telling that tell, tell right? So I'm, I'm, I'm rolling through there. I'm just cruising, just tooling down the road. And I'm in my work pickup truck, headed down to the beach, excited to see my wife. And I get pulled over. I'm doing 45 mile an hour, Gil, 45. Now, normally I'm doing about 70, but I'm doing 45. I get pulled over. Guy walks up to the car. He says, man, uh, you know why I stopped you there? I said, no, sir, I have no idea. He said, well, you're speeding. I said, well, what's the speed limit? He says, 35. I said, on the way to the beach, it's 35 mile an hour. I mean, I, what in the world? Good thing it ain't, you know, somewhere else. It'd take us two days to get there. I didn't say that. I was thinking that. I said, oh, I didn't realize. I didn't know that it's 35 miles an hour. And he's looking at my driver's license. He says, uh, are you from York, South Carolina? I said, yeah, I am. He said, do you know a guy named Roger Neely? I said, yeah, I know a guy named Roger Neely. He works for the sheriff's office. I play golf with him. He said, how about a guy named Brian Trail? I said, yeah, I know Brian Trail. He's one of my good friends. We hang out a lot. We hunt. He said, that's awesome, man. I hadn't seen them in years. And I used to go to the academy. With, I went to the academy with Roger Neely. And I know Brian from this, that, and the other. I said, man, this is going well. He said, I'll be right back with you. <laughs> Goes back to his car. Comes back to my window. Says, sir, I wrote you a ticket for doing 45 and a 35. I said, well, that didn't go too good, did it? I can say it's the friendliest ticket I've ever had, though. But I thought to myself, what in the world? I had no idea, but did it matter I didn't know? It don't matter, does it? You know what I had to do? Pay the ticket. You, you understand that, you know, sometimes when you break the law, you don't even realize you broke the law, but does it matter that you didn't know? No, it doesn't matter. You see, this morning I want to preach to you about missions. You see, what the problem with missions is this. It's not that there's a problem with the Word of God. There's not a problem with the gospel, but there are millions of people who can say, I have no idea who Jesus is. The question is, does that change anything that they don't know? No, it doesn't. Is there still a penalty for not knowing Christ? There is. See, to be mission-minded is to make sure that everybody knows. Take your Bible and look at Romans chapter 10 with me. I want you to see this, and we're going to look at this letter that Paul wrote to the church at Rome and he's talking about this mission type thing, and it's going to take me a minute to get there, but I'll get there. But I want you to consider this letter that's been wrote to the church at Rome. But as we read it this morning, I don't want you to read it like, yeah, Paul was talking to those churches in Rome. I want you to read this letter like Paul was talking to the church in York, South Carolina. I want you to read it like God's writing this directly to you and to I this morning. And let's see the challenge of what Paul says. We're going to read verses 12 down through verse 17. So you follow along with me. Paul says this, For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And shall, how shall they hear without a preacher? How shall they preach except they be sent, as it is written, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Let us pray. Father, we come to you today, and I ask you, Lord, to, this morning, to transfer the burden that you've placed on my heart to the hearts of our people. God, I pray, Lord, that you would help the church to hear your word, to be convicted by your word, and to be changed thoroughly through your word. God, I pray, Lord, that this word would not be just heard, but it would be dealt with, that it would be applied, that, God, we would use it to change ourselves, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Paul was giving us a directive here. Paul was going through and giving us some instructions. Paul was telling us a process. He's giving us a process. And this morning, I want to point out four things out of this passage of Scripture. And if you take notes, if you've got your phone out, or if you've got a pen, I want you to jot these four things down because it's very important that you see them. And I want you to be able to look back and understand what Paul was trying to tell us here in Acts chapter number 10. And I want you to see it clearly for yourself. The first thing I want you to notice is what it says in verse 13. 
For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be, what's that last word? Saved. Saved. Say that one more time. Shall be what? Saved. Saved. Now understand this, and I want you to get this. If you take notes, write this down, that there is a great need in the world today, Brother Daniel, and that need is salvation. I want you to understand that the greatest need the world has today is not a better politician, it's not more money, it's not a better economy, but the greatest need of mankind today is salvation. I I want you to understand that if I could sit beside you today and whisper in your ear as the Holy Ghost wants to, the only thing I would say to you is your greatest need is salvation in your life. You say, preacher, I'm in church What's that mean? It means you're in church. But it doesn't mean that you're saved. It doesn't mean that you've come to Christ. Friend, I want you to understand that who everyone needs salvation. And the greatest need of the world today is salvation. It, people need to be saved. You say, preacher, who needs this salvation? What do I need to be saved from? And I want to say this to you clearly today, that you need to be saved from something that we're all scared of, and that is found in Romans chapter 6 when Paul says this, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Do you understand what the greatest fear of man is? It's called death. I was at the YMCA working out. This guy comes in and says, preacher, what are you doing? I said, I'm running from death as hard as I can. That's what I'm doing. You know what I have found? That death is chasing me every day. It's showing in my hair. It's showing in my wrinkles. Everything hurts. You know what that is? That's death creeping up on me, ready to get me. And you know what I'm afraid of above everything in this world? I'm afraid of dying. How many people know I'm scared of heights? You, know, you take me to Carowinds. I'm not riding anything. Maybe the little Scooby-Doo train, I'll get on that. Somebody said, Preacher, why are you you scared of? The Bible says, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And I'm not about to do it at Carowinds. If you want to trust a 15 year old that got fired at Burger King because he forgot to put pickles on a whopper to travel you around at 90 feet in the air, you go ahead, but I ain't doing it. You know what I'm scared of? Dying. I'm scared he's going to hit the eject button, and there I go. My wife said, We're going to go to the fair. We went to the fair, took the grandbabies, went to the fair. You want to ride the Ferris wheel? No. Are you scared? Yes. I see the guy running it, and I can hear the bolts rattling from right here. They just set that thing up last night. No, sir. You know what I'm really afraid of? Dying. You know why people are afraid of snakes? Dying. You know why you're afraid of spider? You're scared it's going to kill you. You know what your greatest fear is? Death. I don't care what your fear is. It relates back to one thing, and that is we're all afraid to die. And friend, write this down today. You don't know when, and you don't know of what, but you will die in your life. And the only way to be saved from death is Jesus Christ today. The greatest need of the world is salvation Preacher, I'm not sure. I, I, I was born in church. What does that mean? Nothing. Preacher, I've been saved all my life. No, you haven't. Are you a believer in Christ? I've always been a believer. No, you haven't. There was a time you weren't a believer, and there was a time you became a believer. In the moment you became a believer, guess what? You received salvation in your life. You understand that there's not a, a tie, there's not, a, there's not a something you're born into. It's not something you can receive in any way outside of yourself, inside of yourself. We must be saved from death. But the question this morning is who needs it? Paul's very clear. Paul says there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek because the Lord is the same Lord that is rich unto everyone that calls on him. You know what they're saying? That Jesus will save anybody. You know who needs salvation? Rich people need salvation. Poor people need salvation. Friend, you understand that white people need salvation. Black people need salvation. And people of every race need salvation. The good people and even the bad people need salvation today. Those that go to church need salvation. And those that don't go to church need salvation. Did everybody understand what I'm trying to say? God wants to save everybody, everywhere, and everybody needs it. Understand today that the Bible says that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all might come to repentance. God wants to save everyone, 
Every person needs salvation in church. I want to say this to you as clearly as I can today, that if you've never been saved, your greatest need in your life is salvation today. You don't need a better job. You don't need a better politician. You don't need more money. You need salvation today. But I want you to notice verse 14. And, and listen, let me say this too. If you're here and you don't know Christ, don't let these dead people around here that ain't amen and because they need salvation. Don't let that discourage you. They really love Jesus. You just can't tell it this morning. Notice verse 14, what it says. How then shall they call on him? Well, the need is salvation. The, the problem is death. But what is the cure? Well, the cure is found in one word. Him. You see the song they just sang, love has a name. That name is Jesus this morning, church. Understand, church, that the cure for what ails mankind is found in the person of Jesus Christ. Paul said that, Peter said this, there is no other name given under heaven whereby you must be saved than the name of Jesus. The Bible says, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become sons of God. You understand in Acts 16 when Paul and Silas were in jail and, and the jail had an earthquake and, 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 and the Bible says that, uh, that the prisoners uh, should have run off but Paul and Silas just hung around. The, 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 the guard was scared to death and he ran in there and he said, Oh, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And what did Paul, what did Paul say? He said, Go down there and join the Baptist church. Go, go on down to the Methodist church and, and, and join up by faith. Is that what he said? Did he say, look here, you need to go down there and get baptized. Did he say, look, if you'll give me a tithe and an offering. Is that what he said? No, no, what does the Bible say? Paul looked at him and said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. You understand that the cure for mankind's problem is contained in Jesus Christ. He is the power of salvation. He is the answer of salvation. In John chapter 14, Jesus made us a promise. He said, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, that where I am, there you may be also. And boy, Thomas got excited. Thomas is like, woo, heaven. Y'all like heaven? Some of you, I can't tell it because you ain't smiling. You're like, I don't know where that place is. I ain't going there. The Bible says that Thomas got excited, but Thomas is that guy that he's a logical thinker. He says, but Lord, we don't know where you go. We don't know where you're going, and we don't know how to get there. You know what he was saying? He was saying, if I take heaven and put it in my GPS, it says you can't get there from here. You ever done that, put in an address, and it's like, I got no clue where that's at. You, you ever do that? And he says, Jesus, I, I don't know. We, we don't know how to get there. And Daniel, Jesus looks at him, and Jesus says, Thomas, I am the way, the truth in the life. You know what he was saying? Heaven is not something you can buy. Heaven is not, not something you can go earn. But heaven is a place you can go because you know the one who made it and prepared it. And his name is Jesus today. He is the cure for mankind. The Bible says Jesus, when he came to the earth, he said he came for one reason. What was that reason? To seek and to save that which was lost. You understand that Jesus is in the saving business. He's in the life-changing business. He's in the business of giving us everlasting life. Amen. That's what Jesus does. You see, the need is salvation. Every person here needs it. If you're here in this church and you've never been saved, you need it. Amen. And Jesus is the way you get it. He is salvation. The Bible says that his very name means he will save his people from their sins. But I want you to notice verse 13 and 14. I want you to get this because you've got to get it. Some of you here are real process-oriented people. Preacher, I need this thing in a layout. I need a layout so I can understand it. If the need is salvation and the cure is Jesus, how does salvation work? How does it occur? Now, I want you to notice what it says. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, verse 13. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Now, notice the process that he gives us here. It's very clear. The Bible says, first of all, a person must hear the gospel. A person must hear about Jesus Christ. Everybody with me? 
Somebody like me has got to stand in the pulpit and tell somebody about Jesus. The question is, if somebody's going to hear about Jesus, somebody must tell them about Jesus. That's why it's so important for every person in this room to tell somebody about Jesus. Dugan Meredith, somebody needs you to tell them about Jesus or they may not know. See, salvation starts with hearing. The second part is we must believe. You hear who Jesus is. You hear what Jesus did. You hear how he lived. You hear how he died. You hear what he wanted to do for you. And what do you do? You believe it. And the last part is you call on him. You ask him, hey, Lord, will you save me? Now, I'm going to tell you, some people got some weird preacher. How would you get saved? Let me tell you how I didn't get saved. I wasn't that riding down the road and there's some billboard appeared in the clouds. Somebody told me one time, I said, preacher, so I, I, I know I saved because this, this, this smoky mist come in my bedroom one night, stood up in a pile of cloud and said, everything's going to be all right. I said, that ain't salvation, brother. A ghost came in your room. You better burn the house down and move right now. That's not salvation. Preacher, I was riding down the road and I looked up in the cloud and I saw a cloud look like Jesus pointing. You know what that means? You saw a cloud that looks like Jesus pointing. That's what it looks like. You wait 10 minutes, it'll look like a doghouse. Preacher, I had a dream one time. I, I dreamed I was in heaven. I dreamed I was a millionaire one time. But guess what? I ain't. You know what dreams are a product of? Weird imaginations and eating too late at night. That's what it is. Preacher, I know I'm saved because I had a dream. You're nuts if that's what you're depending on. You, know, you understand today that salvation has nothing to do with how you feel. Now, there's some people like me. I, I, I'm emotional, Brother Luther. You get talking about how good God is, I'm going to start crying on you. I can't help it. It's just, it, just, it just runs out of me. Like I mean, I just leak when I, when I talk about God. Man, I get up here, and boy, they get to singing. I'm over here. I'm trying to sing, but I get choked up out right here. I'm an emotional person. Some of you in here, you love Jesus. You're saved, but only God knows it because we can't tell it. But you understand that salvation is not a feeling. Salvation is not something that occurs to you, and all of a sudden you get this warm, oily feeling. That, that's not what salvation is. Salvation is hearing the gospel hearing what Jesus said it is is not just hearing it but then it's believing it how does that belief work how many people has ever had a kid like a like a toddler in the pool you ever took a toddler to the pool raise your hand you know what I'm talking about you know got the little swimmies on and they're at the pool with you? you you know how you put your little toddler up on the side of the pool and you tell them jump to me what do they do they jump why, why do they jump because they're just dumb enough to believe that if you told them to jump, you'll catch them. And they just dive right off in your hands. I'll be honest, though, if Alex told me, I was up here on the roof, and Alex said, hey, jump, preacher, I'll catch you. I ain't buying into that. I'd be like, no, nah, I don't know. But when you're a kid, it's easy to believe your parents are going to take care of you, isn't it? You see, when God told us that he sent his only begotten son into the world to live for us and die for us, and if we'll call on him for salvation, all we've got to do is believe it, Brother Gil. Guess what? We've got to just be dumb enough to believe he'll do what he said he'll do. Amen. But some of you here, you've gotten too smart for belief. Now, I'm, I'm going to tell you, I don't want you to get offended. Please don't get offended. There's a lot of, most of you in here are smarter than I am. Some of you are super smart. But, but I want to give you an example of, so you can understand what I mean. Some of us have learned so much that we can't believe in Christ. How many of you remember when this used to be a gymnasium? Red floor, remember that? Basketball goals hanging down, y'all remember that? And uh, it, 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 all, it, this is all white, there were holes all in the ceiling, y'all remember? That's what it looked, there was a flag hanging up over there. I thought they were patriotic, they were just covering a ginormous terror in the insulation, that's what it was. These walls were white. There was no stage here. There was like a bleachers everywhere. Y'all remember that, right? But you know what? When we moved in here, we did the best we could, didn't we? We tried. We, we were setting up stuff. It was crazy, wasn't it? But you know what? If, if I would have told you that I was sitting in my office, and all of a sudden I heard a great big loud noise down here, and it was like, boom, and I walked in that back room, and it looked just like it does right now, how many people would believe me? You're like, preacher, you've been drinking at work, ain't you? 
That's what you'd be thinking. There ain't no way, preacher, you heard a loud noise and all of a sudden you walked in here and there were 500 chairs and carpet and there was a black ceiling and, and all the holes were repaired and there was a stage built and a sound set. You, you, you would never believe me, would you? Be, uh, some, somehow we've gotten so smart, we believe that at one time there was absolutely nothing in the universe. And a loud noise created me just like I am. Put breath in me. A mind in me allows me to sleep at night, lay in the bed, and breathe while I'm unconscious. It allows me to, to know and to be smart and to learn and to, and to have children and to raise them in different personalities. And somehow we've gotten so smart that we don't believe that there was a God who made us. And I'm asking you this morning, if you've never been saved by Jesus Christ, I'm asking you to be dumb enough to be like that little cool kid on the pool. And when Jesus says, jump to me, I'm asking you just to fall into his arms. That's what I'm asking you to do. You see, salvation is a hearing the gospel. It's after you hear it, it's believing. And after you've believed it, then you just go to him and say, God, save me. I'm going to give you one more example, and I'm going to give you my last point. You know, these early services working out for y'all because I don't eat breakfast. I'm super hungry by the time the 11 o'clock service comes around. How many of you remember Jesus dying on the cross? What, what did he have on each side of him? Talk to me. Act like you've been to church. What did he have on it? Thief, thief right? He had a thief on one side and a thief on the other. Can I say this this morning? I just want you to get this. That that's what's in this room today. A bunch of thieves. There's, there's a bunch of thieves. You say, preacher, I'm a good guy. How dare you call me a thief? You might have your wife convinced you're a good guy, but I know you're not. You know how I know you're not? Because I'm not. I know what my mind thinks about. I know what my heart thinks about. I know the temptations I fight with in my life. You know what I figured out a long time ago? I ain't worth nothing. I'm bad. I'm bad. Just a thief. That's what I am. I, I might be a better dressed thief than some others. I'm just a thief. I want you to understand there's two thieves, right? You got one over here. He's heard Jesus talking. He's heard people talking to Jesus. He's been watching all the stuff go on. He's seen the earthquake come. He's seen the darkness that came. He's heard everybody making fun of Jesus. He's seen those that have come to worship Jesus. And he's standing on his side. What's he say? You're not the Christ. If you're really the Son of God, why don't you get off that cross and get us off the cross? Right? That's what he says. If you're really God, get, what are you doing? What's the other guy over here? thief same guy heard and seen the same things that guy's heard and seen as far as we know in scripture they never met jesus till this moment till they they crucified him he's hanging up here what does he do he tells the guy hey you shut up he says lord now when you hear that word lord you know what we realize he already believes who jesus is doesn't he you see, what's happened is he's already heard who Jesus is, and now it's went from hearing to, he doesn't say, if you're the Son of God. He says, Lord, when you remember me, when you enter in your kingdom, you know what he was doing? He was now calling on him for salvation. And what did Jesus say? Get down and go get baptized. Well, go, 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 go clean yourself up. Go, go live a good life. Son, you ain't tithed ever. You need to get your tithe right. Is that what he said? Get over those addictions you got, problems you got, things you're facing, that immorality you're living in. Right now, you need to get that right. Is that what he said? He said, today, thou wilt be with me in paradise. You know what happened? This man just did three things. He heard the word, he believed the word, and he called on Jesus for salvation. And there's some of you in here, you've heard the word every Sunday you've been attending here, yet you have never believed it. And some of you believe it, but you never called on him. And I want to say this to you today, all your greatest need is salvation. All your greatest need is salvation. I, I've been praying for you all week that that one person in here that doesn't know Christ would. But I want you to see the last thing. That's not even the point of the message. I'm getting there. But that ain't the point of the message. I want you to notice the point of the message is found in verse 15. Missions. It's missions. Verse 15, we see the problem. You understand that the need is salvation. The cure is Jesus. And the salvation process. Understand that there's no problem with the gospel. It works. Why is the problem then? Notice what it says in verse 15. And how shall they preach except they be, read that word with me, 
sent. You understand that around the world there are people who the gospel would work on. It would work. It would change their life. It would do something in their life. It would save them by his grace. They would call on Jesus, but they've never heard it, so they've never believed. Because somebody's never been sent to preach over there. I want you to notice, i got a stat I want to show you, and I want you to see this. Go ahead and change that next slide. I want you to see this. I'm going to explain it to you because I want you to see how big it is. This, of course, is a, is a map of the world, and those red dots are countries that are not Christian at all. Not, not like they're kind of Christian. There are no, that is a non-Christian nation. For instance, Nigeria, you see that? Non-Christian. You, you see Egypt, non-Christian. You see Pakistan, non-Christian. Can anybody see how big China's map is? It's a big, big, big circle, isn't it? But let me put this into a better perspective for you because I want you to see this. Go to the next slide. I want you to see this. And this is, this is staggering. The next slide explains to us exactly what I want you to see. There are 4,400 languages that have no scripture portions available to them. Over 634 million people could not read the Word of God if they wanted to. How many people are familiar with the Mandarin language of the Chinese? How many people speak it fluently? How many people read it? How many people write it? What if the only copy of the Word of God was in Mandarin? How, good, how much would that help you? How much would it help you? You understand that 600 million plus people cannot read the gospel because it's not even in their language. The question is, does that bother the church? That's the question. Does that bother us? Do, does that bother us that that many people can never read the Word of God? If you've got to hear it, to believe it, to call on him, how are they going to hear it? It's not even in their language. It would be like Chinese Bibles laying all over this room and us needing Jesus. That's what it would be like. It would be like you needing the cure for something in your life, but the only way it was written down was in a language you could not read. Somebody hands you a copy and says, hey, this will help you with your cure. This will help you heal that disease you've got. And you open it up and it's just nothing, but you can't read any of it. Can I show you a bigger number that's even more staggering? Let me show you this next one. People groups are considered and broke down into dialects, uh, different, different tribes, different countries. Not necessarily a country, but different tribes. But there's over 5,626 unreached people groups in the world. They total 3 billion people. Almost 40% of all individuals in the world are not gospel-reached people. They're not, they're not reached. 40% of the world is dying and going to hell. Does that bother the church? 40%. You think about that. I'm not, I'm not a mathematician, so I'm going to make this easy. If you had a family of six, what would 40% of it be? If you had a family of six, six people, and I wanted 40%, how many is that? How many? Two and a half? Two and a half? Imagine your family with six people in it and two of them not going to heaven. That, that's the way you break it down. That's the world. That's what, they, that's what they lack. And here's the question. If they need to hear so they can be saved, how are they going to hear? Paul makes it clear. We must send them preachers. Send them preachers. Send them the gospel. Send them help. Now, not everybody in this room, Jerry and me are not getting up and moving to China and starting a church. We've got one problem. We don't speak Chinese. That's going to hurt us. But we like Chinese food. That would be all right. But you understand, we're not going. But you know what we can do? We can send somebody. And if we don't know anybody to go, you know what we can do? We can send the people that are there money so they can do what God's called them to do. We can send money to translate Bibles into things. We can send support, and we sure enough can pray for the world that they'd hear the gospel. I bet you 99% of all Christians, if I looked at your prayer list, give me your prayer list. I want to see on your prayer list whether or not, Daniel, you're praying for the, unlo- the lost that never heard the gospel in the world. I, I, we can pray for them. You, you understand that that many people are dying and going to hell, and the church is worried about what t- color the walls get painted on Sundays. 
what the temperature is set at when we come to church. The Bible says they must be sent. Church, not everybody here is going, but I promise you this. Liberty Baptist Church must become a church that is involved and that is serious and that is dedicated and is, 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 is concerned with sending people to hear the gospel. Because they need to know. Because here's what's going to happen, and I'm going to be brief. Can you imagine standing before God, how many people will walk up and they'll ask the question, is his name in the book of life? No, his name's not in the book of life. Why did you, why did you reject Jesus while you were on earth? And you know what their answer will be? Who is Jesus? Who, who is Jesus? Why didn't you accept his death, burial, and resurrection? What are you talking about? Who, who is Jesus? You see, we see in Scripture many people where they said, who, who is this Jesus you talk about? Those people had not gone anywhere. They're still all in the world. And it's our job to send people, send finances, send support, and certainly send prayers to reach the world. Let's pray. Father, we come to you. God, this morning, you know I ask of you to speak to hearts. Lord, you know the desire I have to see hearts changed, Lord, to see our perspective on life changed. God, I pray, Lord, you would help us today. Speak to our hearts, we pray. Work in us, Lord. Every head's bowed, every eye's closed. No one's moving around. This morning, the question is very important. I want to get to missions here in a moment. But the greater question is this. I know that somebody in here while I was preaching about the need for salvation, I know there's somebody in this room, you are not saved. You may have heard the gospel, you might even believe the gospel, but you've never called on God to save you. I want to say this to you this morning, your greatest need is salvation. Oh, I'd hate to think that one day I wouldn't be in heaven with you after preaching the gospel to you. And right where you're at, it's very simple. You've heard the gospel this morning. The question I have is, do you believe it? And if you do, what would prevent you right in your chair where you're at today from calling on Jesus and saying, God, I know you sent your son to die for me. I know I'm a sinner, and I know I needed his salvation. But God, I want you to save me, wash away my sins. Oh, you can say it any way you want to. He'll know what you mean salvation is the greatest need you have and right where you're at God can save you and to the church I say as we walk through the compassion experience this week that we don't walk through it with an eye that thinks that the, that that country those people need to do better and work harder and maybe something will happen but I want us to walk through it with broken hearts realizing that if we don't send the gospel lives will never be changed people will never know and they'll be guilty before God church we're getting ready to have prayer and as we pray some of you here somebody in this room you need to pray right where you're at while I'm praying and ask Christ to save you put your faith and trust in him you may have worried about your salvation but you can leave this place today never worried about it again let's pray father God, you know my burden and you know my heart, Lord, for that one that's here that needs salvation. I ask you, God, to work in them the faith to call on you. Lord, I ask you, Lord, that they would confess their sin, their belief and trust in Jesus, and that they would ask you to save them. And then, Lord, I ask you that our church would become burdened for the world, burdened for the billions of people who've never heard the gospel who live in darkness. Heads are still bowed, aisles are still closed. If you're here, you said, Preacher, while, that, while you were praying that prayer, I asked Christ to save me. Would you slip your hand up and write back down? Nobody will see it. Just slip it up and write back down. Preacher, I asked Christ to save me. We want to just celebrate with you. I want to pray for you. Slip it up and write back down. Preacher, I gave my life to Christ. I see that hand. Is there another? Preacher, I gave my life to Christ. I see that hand. Is there another? It's the greatest decision you ever know, make. Faith and trust in Jesus Christ. All right, you can look this way. Y'all give those that gave their life to Christ a hand. Would you do that? Y'all just celebrate that. Praise the Lord. We've got a couple things we want to do.
quickly, my wife had a 